Hello, hello everyone. I'm Dasha Jenison with Red Rock Pastel Society of Nevada. And today we have interview on Zoom with our fantastic guest from Colorado, Lorenzo Chavez. Did I say your name correctly? You did. Thank you, Dasha. Appreciate it. <laughs> How are you doing today? Doing good. We're getting some a bunch of snow. We've got about eight inches of snow falling, so it's really pretty. Um, I love fresh snow, so <laughs> Yeah, you can you can tell by some of your paintings, uh, but uh, it's one of your themes. I, it's absolutely a wonderful. The, my favorite time of year right now to paint is the winter season. Just yeah, just I, I don't know why I I respond to it. <laughs> so, how did you start uh, painting? Uh... Good question. So, it, I'll uh, go. I'll step back. I started really young, like a lot of artists probably you talk to we all get this sort of bug early on in our lives and we we enjoy creating and and some of us just stick with it or get uh i think more than that we probably get uh maybe attention from family or from teachers or friends that notice that we're drawing and they might encourage us and that's so helpful for an artist at a young age so i think i sold my first painting when i was in middle school so I would have been like 14. Um, oh, wow. And that was definitely encouraging <laughs> to, to be able to have more money to go buy candy <laughs> and stuff. So, uh, And since then, I, I've just pursued it ever since, since about that age. And just be, it became more and more a, of a uh, lifestyle. And a, I took it more seriously as I got more mature and older. And, um, I don't hope, I hope it never ends. <laughs> we, we hope that too, because it's beautiful. Uh, Lorenzo, so did you start it with uh, pastels at that time or how did you come across the medium? Oh, okay. Well, first I started drawing. That was the big, easy and expensive. So drawing with anything I could get my hands on, uh, charcoal or pencils or ink pens and stuff so I drew a lot as a kid uh a lot I spent a lot of time just drawing so really enjoyed it I think I first became introduced to pastel when I was uh decided to leave my hometown of Albuquerque New Mexico and move to Denver to with the goal of pursuing a, a, a degree in advertising design or graphic design so I moved and started at, at the Colorado Institute of Art. And uh, it was there that I was first introduced to the medium of pastel. It was one of the mediums they had us try uh, for one of our projects. So I was probably in my, gosh, probably 20 years old okay. at that time. Uh, it was the first time I used pastel and just was drawn to it immediately. It's just one of those things that I think it's, it's a, I'm pick, I'm looking over because I got my pastel sets, but you, you pick up a pastel and it's got this gritty, earthy feel, and it just really resonated with how, how it feels in the hand, you know, and it reminded me of uh, being a child and playing in the dirt, I guess, that kind of feel of the grittiness, and, and so I felt, I just loved it right off, <laughs> and it's never gone away, uh, so that's, uh, that was my first introduction to the to pastel. Do you remember what brand was it? Oh, uh, probably Rembrandt because that was, uh, I think, what our teacher recommended. It was very affordable at the time, um, and I think it still is. It's one of the more affordable brands. And uh, this would have been in 1981. And uh, the past, the Rembrandt was a little different then. If um, there was less of the real um, the real hard binder they put on it now, which you kind of have to sand off to get to that softer feel. Yeah, there's there's that's what I just reached into when you saw me pull up the. I know. Yeah, I thought yeah. they have a picture, so uh, they kind <laughs> well, of peek into the treasure box. So. Yeah. So what I was right to the left of me is the the right by the brush that's there is my violets. Uh, collection and that's what I picked up one of the violets that's closest to my my arm reach here by the computer um, but um, 
Yeah, so the Rembrandts were a little different, a little softer then. I think they've become a little harder uh, since then, but it was it's a beautiful medium and I still use a lot of them. Um, yeah, a lot of people refer to Rembrandt as a workhorse. So it kind of does it all and uh, inexpensive yeah. nature helps. So uh, it really is a workhorse. It, it's it's there's a great value range. It's you know, it's great for. Uh, uh, you know, it's affordable for someone starting out in pastel. And it, I believe it still is, you know, and it's, it, of course, once you get hooked, then you want to get all the pastels <laughs> that are made. Of course. <laughs> of course. So uh, I usually ask it later in the interview, but because we're looking at your magnificent box. So let me ask you that. So if you have to go to the deserted island, you know, mm -hmm. and you can take only two brands of pastels with you and one surface so what it would be oh that's a tough question <laughs> yeah i didn't put uh, it on the list then. <laughs> right right that's a that's a tough if i oh my gosh i that's uh uh well you know i'd, I'd have to go back to my start which was simple and that was basic again you know i it's i wouldn't want to do it i like a lot of pestles right we want to no, I want to take all the brands, all the surfaces, but if I had to, I'd probably revert back to when I first began because that was my first love. And that was Rembrandt on a Canson Michin's paper. Um, and I, I think I would, you know, go back to basics. Okay. And, uh, I'm just looking at your beautifully arranged boxes. So uh, this is your plein air setup. How do you set up? Uh, like how how do you create? How do you choose um, order in which you put your colors? Yeah. So you can see it's arranged like a lot of pastels and arranged in terms of color families, the primaries, the secondaries, um, and then in ter in terms of value. So I look at a uh, Early on, the advice I got was when I started arranging my pastels, they said, especially outdoors, where you really want to be able to search for a color quickly and grab that value and color as quickly as possible. So it's important to have it arranged in a logical order. So on, uh, similar to, I would say, someone who might play a piano, you know, it's always set in a logical order and you know exactly where you're going to reach to to touch a certain note. That's how I feel in pastel, in plein air. Um, I can reach, I've got essentially three values, you see. So they're reduced from what you saw from my studio palette. My outdoor palette's got about 150 colors, which, um, yeah, there's the studio palette. There's the, you see the big difference. And mostly it's an issue with weight, right? We're, I'm streamlining. I, I sort of, over the years, I've looked at the my main pastel set, the studio set. And I used to pull out colors that I think would be useful out in the field. And over the years, I found there were certain colors that were just colors I had to have. And they stayed in my plein air set. And essentially, this is what I've, le I've been left with. After about 10 years of uh, pretty serious plein air work, just going out all the time with nothing but pastel and reducing and adjusting. It was, it was quite a, a learning curve. Um, and so I, I would call this is, this is an essential plein air set. Now, I, I, uh, it may vary slightly. You know, if I find I'm going to be painting in a really green climate, you know, I might add a few more greens. If I know it's gonna be more of a desert climate, I might add a few more earthy tones Winter, scene, winter time, I might add more of the light values to adjust it, but usually this is what I take, uh, you know, and that's wherever. I've taken this box to England, Ireland, Italy, France, um, across the US to paint, and I've used essentially this, this color set. Um, and uh, I find it's, 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 work it does most of the work there's a, sometimes you're like a lot of times right you're we're like oh, if i only had the 
extra color or that extra dark value. <laughs> uh, but but with this, you can mix you can mix colors to kind of get a dark value. You can mix it warm with a cool color to get a, a cooler version or a warmer version of something. So so you know that that plays in a, to our pastel making. Um, also, the amount of touch, you know, by say I I grab a dark value pastel, it's it's got the biggest value range possible. By uh, by that I mean I can press really hard and get a very dark mark, or I can slightly lighten my touch as I am going for a lighter value. So I've got a, almost a ten value range with a dark pastel. A medium value pastel, but only made, maybe got five values. And then, of course, a light, basic, maybe one or two value steps I can make. So, um, so you'll see, I tend, to, I tend to take darker and more medium value pastels with me when I'm out in the field. That's, that's very nice observation and very good tip uh, if you're trying to decrease amount of uh, sticks you take in with you with darker uh, with darker value you can get more back for your money so that's... yes so so true and and the other you know the other equation we have is if one works with the tone paper you can set a tone value to really help with the value with the values within a landscape so you know if you're working with a very high key desert scene let's say and it's midday and lots of light and you and you you know you can tone your surface um to a, a high key uh if you're doing a nocturne you can tone your surface to a very dark value so you can the tone really plays an important part in in our in our in the use of the pastel um, um. Let me ask you, I asked you about uh, going to the deserted island, but if you pack in like, let's say for plein air trip, like the one you're heading to, do you um, still refer to your concern mittens or there are other surfaces what you're exploring? Um, right. I still use Canson quite a bit and I love Moonstone. It's just a color of over the years. I've tried, I tried all the various ranges and that one tone, it's a warmish violet tone. It yeah. really works well, especially in the American West, the colors just, it, it just works well as a, as a value and as a undertone that kind of shines through so I don't completely cover the surface. I allow that paper to kind of come through in bits and pieces and it, it works as a harmonizing effect, but it also has a nice grayish tone that um, uh, just lends itself to color. You know, it just, it, it works well with any color that's placed on it. So the other surface I love to use is UART. Um, mostly I think UART 400. And what's fun about that paper is you can tone it, you know, with an alcohol wash, any, any color you want, any value you want. So it really broadens that range. So those are the two workhorse pastels, papers, surfaces I would use. Um, even though I have to say I've tried them all. Yeah, I mean, you got to try them all. <laughs> yes, and uh, select them. But uh, let me ask you more about Kenson. Uh, which site are you using? Smooth? or textured? So I love the smooth side, which is supposed to be the wrong side is what I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm looking over here because I have a, let me, let me show you Dasha. It's, this is a typical board. This is a piece of moonstone. I get a piece of masonite board. It's very lightweight. And um, I tape a piece of Canson to it. And I carry various sizes, so I can have eight by tens, you know, standard sizes, nine by twelves, eleven by fourteens, twelve sixteens, all the way up to I think twenty by twenty four out in the field. So I'll tape several several sheets of Canson to this. So there might be three or four sheets underneath this board. So when I'm done with the first pastel, I can untape it, and there's a clean sheet of pastel paper. So, so you could really, for a day's outing, you could take one board, 
if you say, I'm just going to go out and do five nine by 12s today, you take just one board. So that reduces the weight. So in plein air, it's always about streamlining. Um, but that's so it's the smooth side is on top. And occasionally I, you know, get it wrong and get the, the, it's not really the wrong side. It's actually the preferred side. But <laughs> when I do, I, I can tell it's, it's an obvious difference. Um, but, uh, and then same with UART. I'll take several sheets of UART taped to a board just like this, just a lightweight masonite board. So hope you, uh, that's, that helps simplify it. That's very nice tip. So be prepared, like a Boy Scout. Kind of, yes. <laughs> right. Any other favorite pastels? Because I limited you to one brand. So which ones do you like for what? Which brands do you like for what uh, in okay. your box? So if, so if I could go to a des deserted island with maybe a yacht to take me there. <laughs> Yes, yes. I yes. would like that. Let's on, take a the... paint, on, a, on a painting trip uh, view. Right, right. We could get to fly in or take a yacht, a beautiful luxury lot, yacht into the island. You know, then I'd take the full set. My, my, the plein air set I showed you has, uh, you don't mind me mentioning the brand names then, right? Uh, I... No, 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 no. Uh, we always want to know and uh, what to use. So I can show you. Plein air yeah. set again. Yeah. So if you look over to the left side where the greens are, let's say the bottom light greens, they they're right in that little container. There is uh, new pastel, Jaro, uh, and I believe Rembrandt, and there might be a Schminky in there, and. If you look at, so if you look across the board, you'll see the round one, the round runs are more, the round thicker ones are Rembrandt, the round thinner ones are Giro, and the sticks, the square ones are New Pastel. The reason I use, I would call those more, they're soft pastels, but they're on the harder end of the scale meaning they have a yeah. little more binder than the softer pastels like uh, Terry Ledwig or uh, Unison, which are softer pastels. Those I tend not to take in the field with me uh, because they they tend to be so soft that, you know, if, and I've had this happen. I'm driving in a Jeep out back in the back country and my pastel box is falling, falls out of the car or out of the Jeep. You know, or the easel gets blown over. It's, it, so they 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 take a lot of abuse. The harder pastels. That's the main reason I take them. So it's not that I prefer them. It's just they they'll hand they'll stand up to kind of the bumps and bruises that we get when we're out plein air painting. Um, yeah, I I can relate. Like uh, every plein air artist. Uh, or oh, artists in the field had that happen to them when uh, <laughs> this beautifully arranged pastel box like goes on the ground and you have beautiful mud. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I've, I've uh, yeah, I've actually lost the pastel box in a river, and that was you know forget that. That's <laughs> don't don't ever set up by a river, and <laughs> if, if they fall into the river, they're they're gone. Um, so, so that's mostly what I take in plein air, but in the studio, I, I just allow myself more range. You know, I, I have Ludwig, I take anything and everything. I'll try it all. I've, I've got a great Americans. I've got Terry Ludwig, uh, Sennelier. Um, I, I know I'm gonna overlook some names here, but Giro, I've got, uh, gosh, I'm looking over at my pastel set as I'm, as I'm talking and I'm just seeing all sorts of different brands. So I, I try everything in the studio. I'm, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll try just powdered. I'll break a pastel up and just try powder and brush powder on the surface um, from, from one of the pastels. I've mixed pastels together, you know, just break them apart and mix them and add water and then reform them. Um, you know, you, you, you just keep, keep the exploration alive. Um, in the studio, we have the time to do that. You know, I can kind of play with pastel more indoors. Out, outdoors, you sort of want to be prepared. It's, it's you know, you, you 
you want to have everything set and ready and have a, a structured uh, set you're working with. Absolutely. Um, and um, this is a book, uh, what you had featured on recently, right? By Michael Chelsea Johnson, Beautiful Landscape Painting Outdoors. Uh, congratulations. And can you tell about this feature? You sent it to me. So I think it's a very big achievement to be featured in such a beautiful book. Oh, thank you, thank you. I, it was honor. I was honored to be uh, contacted by Michael to uh, be a, a contributor to the book. I believe there'll be twenty artists that are all la plein air painters, landscape uh, outdoor painters that are in the book, and uh, it will be uh, really interesting because we're kind of he kind of zeroed in on different aspects of what he thought we were strong at. So, you know, my, my paintings are mostly of the Rocky Mountain and Desert Southwest region. Um, and uh, the book is, I believe, going to be released this month, towards the end of the month. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah I, he mentioned you can pre-order on Amazon, but I uh, haven't explored recently. So let us know, post on our Facebook group whenever it comes out. I'm sure there uh, will be some great interest in it i sure will i sure will it, it, it was it's really interesting because i think he he asked each artist sort of different questions about plein air and so if you you know love landscape painting i think it'll be a, a book you'll really enjoy uh, kind of perusing <laughs> lorenzo but we talked already about plein air we talked about landscape so was it always your favorite subject, plein air and, uh, I mean, painting landscape in plein air, or you have in other subjects what interest you? Not at all. I had no idea when I started I would go into landscape at all. I was, I was in love with the figure in portraits, and that was the direction I thought I was going in. Uh, so as a young 20-year-old who came to art school, I, I went I went to study graphic design because I thought that was a way to, you know, find a, 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 a way to make a living while pursuing my art as well, something within the arts. Um, little did I know that it would have a big impact in, in terms of the fine art world, where I met other like-minded artists who wanted that same dream. Um, but early on, it was it was portraits. That's how I saw myself going. So what, if you don't mind, I got a couple books I wanted to share. Oh, so, sure, sure. So one of my early, when I first moved to Denver, uh, one of the well-known Denver artists, a gentleman by the name of Ramon Kelly, who's written a couple wonderful books. And let me pull out the book here. Um, Ramon Kelly paints portraits and figures. And he was... He's a famous for his oils and pastels. It might still be available. It's a, you, you know, this book, I think was published back in the late seventies, but it might still be available, you know, on, on Amazon. On eBay, on Amazon or eBay, yeah. <laughs> exactly, and I highly recommend it. He was, uh, he uh, he's still alive, wonderful man, just fabulous book. Talks all about his process of painting. Uh, and if you're a figure painter, it's a I think it's a must have. It's one of the best books written on uh, on you know painting portraits and figures. So he was an early hero, and fortunately, I was able to meet him. Uh, he he lived in Denver, and I ran across him once at a, an outdoor fair I was in, and he invited me to his studio, and you know stayed in touch and got to visit with him and actually paint with him. So I'd say he was an early mentor. Here with that was one gentleman. Here's another book, if you don't mind me sharing. Um, oh, absolutely. I love the book. Ned, can you see that? It's no glare. It's kind of a shiny yeah. cover. Ned Jacob. Yeah. Ned Jacob, I would say, is also one of the incredible draftsmen. Just a wonderful, uh, he can draw. Oh my gosh. The terrific draftsman, wonderful painter, Mo works mostly in oil and drawing are his two mediums. He did some pastels, but you know, he's such a good drawer. He could, he could do anything. Uh, and I highly recommend this. He was an, also another 
person I met early on in Denver and got to study with him as well and paint with him, paint figures in this studio. So they, they, were, uh, they were early influences in terms of figure work. Like I said, I had no idea landscape would be where I ended up. I, you know, I, I had a clear goal for figure um, and started uh, my professional art career as a portrait and figure painter. I started showing at a gallery when I was 25 and it was uh, going well. Did that for, you know, just mostly showed figures and occasionally I did a landscape, occasionally a still life, but mostly portraits and figure work. And then eventually uh, there was a gentleman in one of the galleries, uh, a young artist by the name of Chuck Martos, um, who had studied at the American Academy of Art in Chicago. And he, he invited me once to go out and paint with him. He said, hey, let's go painting. Uh, it wasn't called plein air. This was probably in 86, 87. He's like, let's, let's go, let's go paint outside. <laughs> so uh, I ran, you know, I didn't have any gear for that. So I had to go out and get myself a little French easel uh, and set, get a set of stuff together. I took oils out and uh, boy, did I bomb. <laughs> My first outing uh, was, you know, and I, I was drawing figures well and showing in galleries and selling my figure work and thought I knew a, a thing or two, uh, but uh, landscape was a whole nother animal. And just, it, it should have discouraged me completely. I should have just said, I'm never going out again. It was freezing. It was my gear, you know, I was fumbling with my gear. I just, but Instead, what it did is it, it really lit a fire of excitement. I was like, what is this? It's so, it was stimulating, but uh, a, a little foreboding or daunting in a way, but it got me excited because of that. It was like, wow, let's, let's go explore this. Let, you know, what is this all about? That's, you know, so that, that completely shifted my focus away from figure and I started go, taking landscape painting more seriously. I was trying to share a screen like let's see how serious you got with your landscape painting so you may send quite a few pastels I think you mastered pretty decent what you oh, think I appreciate that you know it's always it's a learning curve I'm still learning I hope I never stop learning it's it's challenging and inspiring to be outside Dasha you know, you look, you get to explore beautiful locations. Um, I mostly tried to send you paintings that had somewhat of the color red, maybe some orange in it. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I've got all sorts of you know, colors in the landscape. Uh, but times of day, seasons, locations, oh my God, it, it's endless. The variety of subjects. Um, you can see I mostly enjoy landscapes that are sort of well, untouched by man, you know, yeah. by humans. It's, it's, I'm drawn to that. I have painted in cities. I've painted street scenes and, and city scenes. And, but I, I, I'm mostly drawn to pure landscapes and, and I still am. I find the biggest satisfaction being in these places. Um, it's, it's quite a humbling place to set up. And be in this vast landscape and to listen to the sounds of nature and to feel the wind or the heat or the cold it it brings another dimension to the painting you know you're, you're sort of experiencing life very focused and in the moment uh and in plein air because it is a very fleeting period of time you've got to stay focused and really and stay on task. And so it's, you stay in the moment painting landscape. You kind of forget your troubles if there are any, you know, you forget everything except what's right in front of you. And 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 I love that. It's it's a it's a very focused way of working. And and I highly recommend it for for people that are interested in landscape to, to get out and paint. The landscape in front of the scene is there's just nothing like it. It's it's uh, 
there's rewards way beyond I, anything they would have ever said about it. You know, well, the early mentors always said, go out, if you want to get good at landscape. This is when I finally decided I wanted to become a landscape painter. You know, I was take, I'd go out and take photos and come back and do them in the studio. And all the professionals I talked to always said, you've got to go paint outdoors, paint outdoors as much as possible. And, um, and I thought the reward would be, okay, you become a better landscape painter, but so much more than that, you become, you know, it's nature is such a, a wonderful place to be. You're, you're immersing yourself in the senses of nature the the climate the different terrains um to the point now today it's like i go out set my box up i'm painting but I, i'm not worried about whether the painting is going to work or not that's not the goal anymore to me it's just to be there and to experience that moment in time you know and, and because of that i know i'm learning something I'm, and i'm it's it's all going up to the sort of the uh the mind and staying memories are staying there and and uh, I think that's more valuable than what the outcome of the painting is anymore I think it's it's uh, it was in the early days you know whether or not I had a good painting I always thought that told me whether the work was successful or the day was successful now it's I can't lose it's going to be successful just being outside <laughs> <laughs> good painting or bad it's 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 the experience is always well worth it's it. great it's a great attitude to have and speaking of which uh, there is something exciting coming up april 7th and 8th there is an event uh with you can you tell about that please yeah, so this is uh, through the uh, Utah State University East, and they're in Price, Utah, and I got contacted by the uh, professor of art there, Noel Colmack, whose email's on this flyer, and he asked me to put together a show. They've got this beautiful gallery space that, uh, and I, I'm, I just sent him 45 works. Um, Mostly my focus is on the paintings I've done of the Colorado Plateau area, you know, which encompasses four states, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. So the ball, all the work is within that realm of the region. It's an area I find very inspiring. Um, so the show is going to have a mix of plein air works as well as studio works that were all inspired from this part of the country. And then I'm doing, uh, he asked me to do a, a workshop. Uh, so I'll be teaching a two-day workshop there in Utah, which is beautiful, red rock country. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I'm looking forward to it. That's, that's just an inspiring place to set up and paint. Uh, so if you're, if you're looking for something uh, to paint that is inspiring, I, I hope you'll come out and join us. Uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's going to be fun. I, I always enjoy my times out in Utah painting. That's really cool. I will include it in the email, or feel free to contact uh, Lorenzo on Facebook and ask him questions. So if you're going to come out to Utah, plein air paint, um, that'd be great. <laughs> the, <laughs> yes, we are working also on something exciting this spring. Where to Red Rock shows um, coming up and one of them is online show. It's our already traditional anticipated online jewelry member web show, but it's members only. Okay, so you need to be a Red Rock member to enter and there is great prizes, thousand dollars best in show and other great sponsored uh, prizes by our friends, pastel manufacturers. So it's always cool show. Artists from all over the world uh, and neighbor states are entering. Uh, if you are a member in a good standing and read the prospectus, so uh, paint it from your own photo reference and use 80% of pastels, uh, you can enter our show. And uh, it's very great. But Lorenzo, please tell me like why anyone should enter competition? Oh, good question, Desha. It's, uh, you know, 
It's it's a good thing to do. I, I have found that entering your work in a competition keeps us um, thinking about our quality and how our work will be presented. Uh, it's and and how it will be viewed uh, amongst other work. So it kind of raises the bar, so to speak, in our efforts to become a better artist. Uh, just knowing that we have that goal that we want to get a work ready for a show and and that we want to submit it. Um, you know, it's it's sometimes a little frightening to want to submit your work to a jury, uh, but it's it's uh, I, I, I'm sort of in the belief that, you know, you. You, you don't know unless you try, <laughs> you've, you've got it, you you know, try it. And, and know full well, you know, I've entered many times in exhibitions and win some, lose some. You've got to have the attitude, you know, let's uh, kind of almost like a baseball attitude. Get up to the bat. You're not going to hit a home run unless you step up to the the uh, the plate to the strike at the ball. And that's all it is with this. You, you, you know, win, whether you get in or not, it's going to feel good to have done it because it's 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 it takes courage and and I really respect and honor everyone who who does that to you know just takes that extra step to to get their work seen. Uh, I, I know it's not for everyone, but but those that are kind of toying with you know wanting to get their work seen and shows it's it's a it's a wonderful uh, thing to to go for. Um, I, I kind of look at it. Um, these days when I send a work off and I do every year, I send works off to different shows. As soon as I send it out, I, I kind of, I kind of look at it. I used to be a fisherman. And I kind of look at it as like I'm casting a lure out in the water. And the more lures I cast out, the more chances I get a bite, you know, some aren't going to bite and some are, and I, I, I don't get too uh, worried about whether it works or not. I just, I just think that what is more important is to, to have it out there and, and see what see what bites. And um, you never know what will come from it. Um, that's, yeah. that's a great piece of advice. And uh, may I bring something up? So you sure. say you, I wanted to see you among our jurors, actually, as a judge of our in-person show. And uh, I hardly ever get a no as an answer, <laughs> but I learned to accept that. And thank you for agreeing doing this interview with me. So at least sure. I got one yes. Um, <laughs> tell me advice like from the juror uh, jur and a judge live experience. Like somebody is preparing their work to send and say like, they don't know which one I should send, this one or that one. Um, what to, not what you look, maybe say what you're looking for as a judge or how you answer these questions as an artist. There are always several points of view on this subject. Right, right. What to send in, right, is your question. Yeah, what, yeah, what, yeah. What, what to send work in. to send in. So, you know, I create a lot. So I'm, I, and a, a lot of us are always constantly creating works, um, you know, and there's certain works that just are just stronger than others. And we kind of know it innately. We feel it like, I know this is a stronger work than something else I may have done. Um, I find it, it's helpful if you have a good friend or a family member who's, who's very good at giving you their honest opinion to get them to take a look at the work and, and, and ask them, you know, it, it, should I enter this? And, and uh, it's, and at other times you just feel good about it and you just want to enter it anyway. So um, I think you've got, you've got to feel good about it and, and it feel like this is, this one worked out. Let me, let me put it out there. Um, and, and that, that would be the best advice I'd give for considering what show to enter. Now, of course, um, you know, if you're, this is a pastel show. So of course it has to be a pastel and there are certain criteria, right? And, you know, it's gotta yeah. be 80% pastel you said. So that's important. Um, so, you know, you want, you definitely wanna 
look to find follow those rules, so so to speak, keep keep the pastel mostly pastel. Um, but uh, you know, you'll just know there's certain pieces that just feel right. I, I find it's helpful to. I find what's helpful is not to work towards a show, like not paint a painting thinking this is going to be entered in a show, but just yeah. paint as often as you can and then set aside the ones that work out good. Keep those in reserve. Keep those and, and then say, I'm going to use these for special exhibitions. Um, you know, it's always really hard to say, okay, I've got a, a, a show deadline. Let me paint something for this. It's, 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 I find for me anyways, it's, it's a frustrating way of working. <laughs> it, 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 the, the joy should be there when we're painting. So I think it's so important to, to just stay constantly busy painting and set aside the best ones you have and keep, keep them in reserve for shows. And um, um, yeah, I, it's, it's uh, and I find that's true with a lot of professionals I know. They rarely paint for shows. They paint constantly and they set aside works for possible shows. And uh, now that's excellent answer and great advice, create a lot, pick the best work what uh, feels right and uh, just uh, keep the game alive. I have another question. So um, sure. as a judge, like when you uh, judging to work, um, like what are you looking for in a painting? Like what's award-winning painting for you? Yeah, that's a good question. It's uh, I've been asked. I've been very fortunate to be. You know, I've asked to judge shows on many occasions. Um, um, you know, it's and I always uh, I go back to that idea. Everyone that enters a show, I just really respect and admire that they took the time and effort to do that. Uh, it's not easy to do. And to me, in my eye, they're all winners. Just the fact that they took the took the gamble and, and entered. Um, you know, once you're during a show, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it can be a number of things that uh, make a piece kind of get admitted to a show or get uh, to the point where maybe they're considered for a, an award. Uh, I, I find what kind of what resonates with a lot of jur judges and, and jurors I find is, you know, cause I've juried many shows where I'm doing it with a couple other jurors and, and we always seem to agree a lot on the same things. And that's, uh, you know, you can see the love of painting, the passion comes through uh, the craftsmanship, that means excellent design, drawing, color, you know, it comes through, um, passionate about the subject, you know, one should always paint the subject they're passionate about, uh, not a subject they think will be uh, something that a judge might like, but something they love, and, and I think that comes through it just it's it's like I, I relate it to music you know when you when you hear a musician singing a song and they're putting their heart into it you feel that you know you can feel that in the same with a painter when they're doing that they're putting their heart and they've got and you could their technical skills are there but more important their heart is there it comes through and it's a it's a vibration you feel and and I think that's an ingredient that's always got to be there that that love of the subject love of the medium they're working in love of the craft of the medium and and as long as you're working in that realm I think you're going to be happy whether the work is admitted or not because you gave your love to it <laughs> you gave your heart to it and you're going to you know and I know that there's paintings I've done that I have found where oh gosh, I really, I love doing it. They weren't admitted into a show, but I, I still loved them because they were enjoyable to do and I enjoyed the process. And eventually it's gonna connect with someone, maybe a collector or maybe some other show. Um, but that's, but I think that comes to when you look at a body of work, when you dream, that, that comes through, that, that sense of how much enjoyment the person had 
in the in the you know in the creative process. Um, there's a great book I highly recommend. It's written by the writer Ray Bradbury, who was a science fiction writer. And it's it's this is interesting because an artist told me about this book back in the 80s. It's called Art. His the book is called Writing. Oh, or is writing. Oh, Zen and the Art of Writing. So it's written. He's a writer and he's read, read, writing about the writing process. But if you just change the word writing to painting, and one yeah. of the critical points in the book he talks about is how important your skills are. You know your drawing, your design, you know, composing, in his words, the, the written page. But then at one point he says, but, you know, 50% of the success of a well-written thing is how much gust or zesto you bring to it. And that applies to painting too. So you have all these technical things, but if you're not bringing, if we're not bringing our our gusto, our zest for the subject, our zest for this, the medium, it's gonna, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be as well done. <laughs> that's, uh, so that's, and that's 50%, that's a high equation. For, yeah. You know, if you were to build a, 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 a recipe of success, 50% is that it's, proportion. It's a lot, that's, yeah. Yeah, it, so. That's very important because I uh, talk to artists from different backgrounds, from different starting points, you know, and I hear a lot. I wish I could, uh, I would have more time uh, when I was a kid. I wish I went to art school, but uh, if it's 50%, as you're saying, it gives a whole different look how it block you know it's mean your heart is there you you can put your heart 100 percent over time and, exactly. and get rest of the skills so like if it if it feels right uh people will see it and as you say it will be noticed in the show or by the collector or you'll just enjoy doing it so you can hit all three or at least uh, one so Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, in his book as well. He says, you know, if you're not having fun creating, he said, you know, uh, and he's talking for, he's talking to professional writers as well. He's saying, you know, if it's no fun, he says, why don't you, you know, it's easier to be a, dip, a ditch digger, you know, it, for one, you're going to get exercise at least. And, and, and so he's sort of saying, you know, it's the the arts, the writing, painting, music is it's an it's something we should enjoy doing because that's that's really uh, what it's that's its biggest reward is the the joy we get from it and the joy possibly that if we get joy from it that joy will be you know shown to others. And I think there'll, there'll be a response from that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. And it gives, like, it gives a different perspective. Uh, may I ask you about your favorite artists? Uh, you can name contemporaries or you can name historic artists what inspire you, uh, like, whom do you want? Um, just oh, that's a, another good question. <laughs> that's, a, you know, that's hard to whittle it down to one. You know, we're, so I'm going to go back to basics again, back to when I first, the first thing that ignites our passion, right? What was the artist? Yes. And I, I mentioned two. Uh, here's another one. I'm going to grab a book. Um, this guy, Richard Schmidt. Yeah, I don't know if you uh, can see that, Richard Schmidt. Yeah, that's this is landscape painting book. He's you probably have a copy you're looking for. Good for you. Uh, yes, I have. Oh, perfect, perfect. He's inspired so many artists. He he's just fabulous. Uh, I yeah, a friend, an art friend of mine sent this to me back in the early '80s, and uh, he's he's yeah, I I highly recommend him. Incredible, incredible teacher. I was fortunate to study with him. Uh, take some workshops with him 
and his passion comes through and he'll talk a lot about the same things we've talked about his the love of the subject the um you know in fact he has a famous quote i think he says if paint what you love and love what you paint that's one of the things he talks a lot about but but what really got me fired up he hey, this is a landscape book this was probably the first book once i decided i wanted to go into landscape. This is the one I think had the biggest impact. Um, but in this book, he mentions same question. They're asking him, what are some of your favorite painters? And he mentions a few artists. And he mentions real briefly, this Italian pastel painter, Giuseppe Cascara. He said he was a master at pastel. He painted the Mediterranean. And then Schmidt says, Pastel is one of the hardest mediums there is. And again, it was like the plein air painting, that challenge. It's like, oh, I like that. That sounds like <laughs> that sounds like a yeah. challenge. Let's so 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 it seems like you like to challenge yourself uh, with uh, uh, like when more challenging, when more interesting it becomes to you, right? So you're not giving so. up, you're like, oh. It's I think so. It, it, let, it, let, it, let me do more. Right, right. Yeah, bring, bring it on. <laughs> but it was so that challenge. So it was like, okay. So that kind of gave me permission, like, let me go and paint plein air and pastel, uh, which, you know, at the time, I know now it seems like, you know, there's a lot of people doing it and there probably were. But back, this is in the mid 80s when really you had mostly magazines to look at. There wasn't a lot of, things online to look at. There was, I think there was only one pastel society, the Pastel Society of America, here in America anyway. Um, and it didn't seem like there was a lot of pastel painters painting in landscape then. So it, it, I thought, well, this is fun because it's, it's something not a lot of people are doing. And it, there was, the challenge was there, how to learn how to do it. So I, I mostly took workshops from oil painters, people like, Richard Schmidt and Clyde Aspavig, oil painters who didn't teach pastel, but taught fundamentals of landscape painting, which transferred to pastel. Um, so that, that opened the door to just keep exploring the medium of pastel. Um, and for years, I was searching for this artist that Richard Schmidt mentioned, this Giuseppe Gascara. You know, you couldn't Google it. <laughs> back then so go to every bookstore wherever I whenever a city I was at I would visit the bookstores and see if I could find a book and finally after, I think about 15 years later and when I was in Italy I found a copy and I'm grabbing the book I found a copy of his book so it took 15 oh. years <laughs> now you could find in a click of a button uh, his works and oh what an inspiration outstanding Outstanding. You could probably Dasha, maybe show some images of his if you look online, but there's there's some beautiful um, pastel images, really loosely done pastels. He painted the Mediterranean near Italy. Um, so well worth the wait to find this book. And now I think there's other books on him that are now available, but I highly recommend checking out this artist's works. Um, so he's one of, well, you asked some of the artists that have inspired. So Schmidt finally finding this artist for pastel, you know, in the early days for pastel landscapes, you know, there were, um, Albert Handel was an early inspiration. He was one of the artists who had one of the first books out that I can recall on pastel landscape. Uh, so that was, all, at that point, I was into painting quite a bit uh, and pastel painting quite a bit at that point. Uh, a really early influence was this book, Pastel, by an artist by the name of Daniel Green. Yeah. Daniel Green. And I think this is, might still be available. Mostly he talked about the figure, but it gave a lot of great insight to how to handle the medium. He didn't talk much about how to handle it in landscape, but he, he does teach you how to use the medium. So I, I think his work was highly influential in terms of the medium of pastel. Um, in terms of 
landscape lessons. I'm grabbing a couple more books. I got books coming. <laughs> the, this one, I highly recommend it if you're interested in landscape. John F. Carlson, a lot of landscape painters have probably heard of this. It's a classic written in the 40s and it's still just a well-worn copy, um, dog-eared and written all over. But it's it's if you're interested in the fundamentals of landscape, I highly recommend his book. Um, and then here's the other one I highly recommend for landscape, Composition of Outdoor Painting by Edgar Payne. Wow, we need, we need to get a book list from you, you know, like uh, re reading list. So I'll send a book really... list. I'll send. So you learn so much from these books. They teach you the fundamentals. I don't teach you the medium of pastel, but they really teach you about building a composition and design and values and how to structure a landscape. And, and, um, and then you just apply that to the medium of pastel. Um, so here's here's something that um, a lot of people I, I never took I've never taken a pastel workshop. You have not. I have never taken one, and mm. I I've, I've always studied with oil painters mostly because it was a certain I liked their work or it was a certain thing they did. Um, I, I found, not that I'm saying you don't, I think it's important to take from a pastel landscape painter. I just, where I was, there weren't a lot of the pastel landscape painters. As a young art student starting, um, I couldn't really afford to travel <laughs> to take a workshop out, out of state and there really weren't anyone locally. So mostly it was landscape oil painters. And these were the books they were recommending and I would just apply pastel you know, I, I, when they started talking about brushes and canvas, I, I just sort of went blank. But when they started talking about shapes and values and atmospheric perspective, I was like, well, you know, eyes wide open. This is what I, we need to hear. And then just using the medium of pastel. Um, so can I share another thing that related to absolutely, pastel? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. So, so when I, when I, when I first started um, painting landscape, there was a school that opened here in Denver. It's called the Art Students League of Denver. It still exists. And I started studying with an artist named Mark Daly, who's a really wonderful uh, oil painter. Um, and um, I think it was 27 at the time. It was a brand new school, packed. We probably had 40 people in the classroom. His class was mostly about figure painting in oil. Um, but in that class, um, there was a gentleman I met who um, we hit it off, a guy named Terry Ludwig. <laughs> oh, I may have heard that name. Oh. Yeah, I, think, the, yeah, I saw I, it on the pastel box. He, you may have heard of Terry and so I, 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 I met, met him, I, he was- I'm, I'm kidding, I met Terry at the <laughs> I, I, I visited the stars. Every, so yes. Everyone loves <laughs> Terry. He's become an icon in the art world. Well, Terry, Terry, I've known Terry for many years. He, uh, I met him at this class. Uh, he had studied at the American Academy of Art. Uh, and one of the things they have him do at the American Academy of Art are these color charts, which you'll, you'll see Richard Schmidt talks about the color charts in his book. because. Richard Schmidt was also a student of the American Academy of Art. Um, and here's a booklet that I did. It's, it's an oil painting color chart that I did to, with the help of Terry, back because he had done it in art school. And so he helped me help walk me through the process. And you put these charts together, you go through your, it's called the Rubens palette and you mix every color with every color and you end up with these wonderful charts. Well, um, the influence it had in terms of pastel is when I was done with it and spending time mixing the paint and I was just getting into plein air painting, my mind went to, God, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could have all those oil paints mixed up already. So when I go out painting, all I have to do is just pick up the colors. They're already mixed. And it hit me, you know, boom. Pastel. <laughs> you look at those, those uh, 
drawers of pastels, they're, the colors are already pre-mixed. They're all arranged in values, just like the color charts, you know? And so it, if that's kind of, and basically I arranged my box based off this color chart. That was how it started. Um, and what it did instead of these color charts, instead of in, inspiring me to go into painting in oil, it completely took me away from oil and I went completely into pastel uh, and I gave up oil painting for about 25 years. Didn't touch oils at all. Cause I thought, oh, there's your premix palette. <laughs> uh, you know, every color you could possibly want, uh, premix ready to go, never dries. What a perfect plein air medium. So uh, thank you, Terry, for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Terry, for that and for a few boxes what we have. Right, right. And yeah. uh, some, some of your charts did look like some sets what they have. And it's like, oh, I know this set. It's umber shaped. So. Exactly. Uh, so, so in the early days, Terry started his pastels based on these color charts, his first yeah. color mixtures. Um, and it was fun because, like, you know, when he was first starting, he'd invite me over to his house and we would mix colors together and come up with colors and you know at that time he wasn't a business you know he was just doing this for fun and for love this is what I'm talking about where love takes you right <laughs> just let, let me make these pastels like and and here try some you know and, and of course it grew into a, a wonderful pastel business for Terry uh, it didn't start that way it started just because of his love of mixing color and making colors and uh uh, he, you know, fortunately for us, he's, he's, he, he did that because they're, they're just wonderful pastels. Unfortunately for all the, the, all the art manufacturers that create the tools that we get to use, um, you know, we should be grateful to them. <laughs> and uh, they always are. Lorenzo, uh, I'm going to show a few more of your works. Okay. They just spectacular and you send me much more but uh, please follow red rock on social media please follow lorenzo on facebook sign up for his uh, website check out youtube workshop uh, be on lookout uh, for michael johnson's plein air painting uh, book and uh, we're gonna release this interview on youtube our instagram tv and um Next time we'll talk and uh, see each other hopefully in person. And I really I hope, so. uh, hope you will enter our show, one of the two, so in person or online. So the two shows were coming up, and I hope uh, you will enter as a participant oh, awesome. and uh, we can see your work among our members and friends, you know. So I love hopefully that. in Las Vegas. Yeah, I think I think, and, and you said the theme is red, which is really interesting. Tell me a little bit about that, Dasha. Tell me about the theme. Yes, uh, we decided for our first in-person exhibition, uh, do a theme show, because uh, theme kind of gives the viewer different perspective. And we started with the first word of our society, and its interpretation so you can interpret it as a color or as red rock canyon or as red rock in southwestern landscape so it's all up to you but it kind of gives uh, direction so but if they'll go with orange for the second show no. then it's a color but it's also can be something different so it's all up to you it's artistic interpretation and as you know, you cannot get it wrong in art. It's just your own vision. So right. that I would be that. that would be something interesting. And our first in-person show in Las Vegas in the beautiful gallery with great light. Um, I'm excited so to see yeah. what uh, our jurors will be able to curate from the, all the work was sent. And this show is actually open to everyone. So you don't have to become a Red Rock member, but the theme is, uh, it's juried. There is no guarantees and theme is red. 
What, what a wonderful thing. I love it. <laughs> Those are great. Um, it's, it's always fun. To, whenever I'm jury theme shows, they're always really interesting because you, you sort of see the collective and how they've interpret, ter, interpreted uh, that certain theme. And, and sometimes it, I don't see it as a limitation. It's actually kind of a, a, an expansion of, you know, wow, how do we, how do we take this theme and, and use ideas based on the theme? Um, so recently I juried a show uh, out here in Colorado that had a theme uh, as well. And it was just fun to see how everyone that submitted what they entered relating to the theme. It was made for a really intriguing show. And I think a lot of the artists enjoyed attending the show to see what, what artists came up with based on the theme. And um, and uh, also the uh, the viewers were really excited by seeing because but seeing the show because the theme also uh, brought brought uh, new ideas to artists and and I think a lot of artists were painting things kind of a little outside of what they might normally do and it was exciting it was like wow this is this is interesting to see to see what what they would do with the set theme so uh, it should be an exciting show. Dasha. Yes, we are looking forward to it and I appreciate your time today to see and uh, my earpiece just died so I hope uh, oh. sound didn't change much on your end but uh, thank you so much and we'll stay in touch. I appreciate your time and uh, talk to you soon. Thank you for watching us. Please subscribe to our channels, like video, ask questions and uh, we're going to promote our show with more interviews. Have a beautiful day, everyone.